Hello my steel design friends. In this video I'm going to show you the basics of Euler elastic buckling and some mechanics approaches to column theory. This will be a mechanics materials review and will basically show you the basis for the methodology that AISC will employ in future videos. So without further ado, let's get started. In the mid-1700s, a mathematician by the name of Leonard Euler um, came up with um, a basic column theory equation. Um, later, it became known as the Euler elastic buckling limit for members. And this is the basis of what AISC is going to utilize in estimating the capacities of these strengths. It's a very mathematical-based approach and uh, you know, has its roots in you know, mechanics and materials, strength and materials is, is the the relationship for it. Now his basic assumptions and what I'm going to show in this video is kind of where this equation comes from and it's going to take advantage of a lot of the parts that we've um, learned in previous series and in previous classes. Okay so his, the first of his assumptions was is that he was going to define a member uh, acting along an x-axis okay and I under a load P if this member is small enough, it will experience a lateral deflection related to the compressive load. So what we want to know is what is the limit on P such that this phenomenon starts to occur. Okay, so Y is the lateral direction, X is the longitudinal, the length of this guy is L. Okay, and so what we do is we go through and we cut an arbitrary section through this member and we draw a free body diagram of it in its deflected shape. All right, so if I draw a free body diagram of this left end for an arbitrary piece cut at position X, then this is what it looks like. You have internal forces where you cut it. So I've got a shear, a normal, and a moment applied to that. I've got my support load P, which is acting horizontally up here along this dotted line, if you will. Okay, and so the dotted line represents where the column was before it buckled. So this is before, this is after. Okay, and so the amount that it moves, we're gonna call as Y. Okay, and so Ultimately, what we're looking for to derive is an expression for y as a function of x, and that's ultimately what we're after. Now, the end conditions are very, very important here. He assumed that both ends were pinned, meaning that this point always stayed on the x-axis and this point always stayed on the x-axis, but only the middle is what bowed. Okay, so if we start talking about columns with side sway, this method won't quite apply. We have to do something a little bit different. But those are our basic, um, basic assumptions, the boundary conditions, if you will, are that it's pinned at both ends. All right, so all he did is he took a moment about the cut line, so this moment at z, um, about the z-axis, that's what the z-subscript is, okay, was equal to zero, and so the equation that you can derive off of this picture is that the moment about the z-axis minus p times that value y is all equal to zero. Okay, that's all. It's a very simple relationship, a very simple moment equation, which means then that the moment about the z-axis is equal to p times y. Okay, now, if you recall from you know, our structural analysis classes, okay, one of the most important equations in computing deflections was the relationship that the second derivative with respect to y or to the elastic curve with respect to x, okay, it was equal to minus that moment value, okay, all over EI. Now again, z is a subscript, it's not another multiplier in here, okay, so it's just the moment is that moment here is all it's saying. Okay, and so that becomes our basic equation for us. So if I take this equation and plug it in up here, you notice mz is in both places. Okay, so I can take this, plug this in up here and then do a little bit of rearranging, if you will. Okay, and basically it boils down to dividing everything by ei in this equation and you get an expression that looks like this. The second derivative of y with respect to x plus p over ei times y is all equal to zero. It's an ordinary different second order differential equation. Now again, without getting into the, ma the mathematics behind this, from a differential equations class, we know that the general solution for y, which is my equation as a function of x, is equal to a is some constant times the sine of k times x, where again k is a constant, plus another constant b times the cosine of k times x. Okay, and that's our general solution. Okay, now the value k in this expression can be shown that it is that k squared is equal to p over ei, okay, or that k is the square root of p over ei. So we're going to write it as a 
uh, in this way, and then we'll make some substitutions back into this. Now, our challenge, like with any general solution to a differential equation, is we have to apply boundary conditions, okay, to be able to, to solve for these constants, if you will. So for a simply supported beam, such as what we have happening here, we know that at this end, there was no deflection. At x equals zero, y was zero. Okay, and so that's our first boundary condition, which is down here. Okay, and then likewise, at x equals L, which would be this point up here, then y is also zero there. Okay, so if we apply those into my equation y, we get the following. x equals zero and y equals zero, then that implies that this b constant is a zero value. Okay, so this last term basically vanishes. It's basically a sinusoidal function that defines the elastic curve. And that's kind of what, if you look at it, it's kind of the shape that it's taken on. It's kind of a sine behavior on that, okay? And then if we plug in, okay, at x equals L, you know, and y equals zero into that equation, we can solve that we get an expression that zero is equal to A times the sine of K times L will be the solution of this. Okay, so now the whole challenge in this is to figure out, well, what are the possible solutions that exist for that little function there? Okay, and there are three possible ones. Okay, the first one is, is that if A is zero, okay, that basically means there's no, no deflection anywhere. Okay, this equation becomes just Y equals zero. So basically there's no deflection on, on that happening. So that's kind of a non-realistic case for what we're looking at. Okay, the other one is that K times L is equal to zero. Okay, if I make this term inside the sine zero, then the then my a is also zero on that one. This is basically the no applied load case, right? Because if l is never zero and k is the only term that has a p in it, okay, the only way that k is zero when e and i aren't zero is if p is zero. So there's no load applied. And again, that's kind of a non a non case for structural engineers. Now mathematically, you have to account for them, but you know, but so these first two are kind of trivial solutions, if you will. But the third one is the one where the magic happens, right? So we know that at the sine of zero, we got a zero value. But we also know that at the sine of pi, I get a zero. And at the sine of two pi, I get a zero. And three pi, I get a zero. And for any value of a constant n from zero to one to two to three, so forth and so on, that kl is equal to n times pi, okay? And this guy is Euler's buckling criterion, okay? So what we do is we can kind of take this and kind of substitute it back in and say, all right, well, if this is the case, we can go back up to my governing differential equation on this thing and you know, basically solve for you know, our expression for y. We get an equation that says, all right, well, n times pi over l quantity squared is equal to p over ei, okay? And that's all we've done is basically kind of resolve this differential equation for him. Okay, so, so that's our value. And so if I take this and I rearrange it a little bit, then P is equal to N squared, okay, pi squared EI over L squared, okay, where N is now the mode of buckling, okay. And by mode, we mean kind of the general shape. So, you know, an N can be zero, one, two, three, so on and so forth, any value of n. All right, so what does n look like? Now, so for our first couple of cases, obviously an n of zero is a no load case, okay? But let's take a look at some of the others. What n equals one means is that my function is actually basically a single curve between the two points, okay? And n equals two means that there are two curves in it. That basically it crosses at two locations. So it crosses zero once here. Okay, and n equals three means that there will be three curves. n equals four, so on. And so this is the general relationship. This is the effect of n. Okay, now in structures, in most structures, they are framed in such a way that this guy is the most likely to occur. He's the smallest load. If I plug in n equals one, I get a p-value. Okay, if I plug in n equals two, I get four times that value. If I plug in n equals three, I get nine times that value. Okay, it's generally the f n equals one and n equals two cases are the most common or prevalent ones in the structures. Now, you can get higher order ones, but for what we're looking at in, in our basic steel design, we're looking at these two, okay, where this one is by far the easiest to occur. So, but here's the, here's the kicker on this, is that when you're designing a column on this, if I know that I'm in a mode one shape, all I have to do is provide a brace, which basically holds this point at zero, and you get this curve, and you now quadruple the load or I brace it at three point, or at two points, 
you know, put a member here and here and hold it, and then I can get three, three curves, and it's nine times the load. Okay, so, so this lateral sway significantly weakens the load that a column can take, okay? And so this is our P critical, okay? If that's our buckling load, depending on the mode that we want. Okay, so now the question becomes, what do we do with it? Okay, so if we look, what we say is we say that, now, well, which mode requires the least effort? And this is what we just said. The answer is mode one, where n equals one. So if we define the critical buckling load for mode one, okay, PCR is equal to pi squared EI over L squared. That's the buckling equation that you guys learned back in mechanics materials. Okay, now, if we make a note, we're going to modify this formula ever so slightly. This is the version that you learned previously. Okay, we're going to make a note that the radius of gyration of the member and remember, is the square root of I over AG. Now, again, remember there's an RX, there's an RY, and an RZ for some members, okay? And the corresponding I over A that goes with those, okay? So what happens is, is that if I take this load and I divide everything by area, this gross area of the cross section, you'll notice that I now get a P critical over an A. Well, that is a critical average stress. It's the, it's the critical buckling stress associated with this. And this is a term that you'll see a lot in the AISC manual. Okay, but I also get an I over A. Okay, and if I look at that, well that's the same thing as the square root of I over A, which is the radius of gyration, or the radius of gyration squared shows up. Okay, so I would have pi squared E R squared over L squared. Now, if I take the R and basically, instead of putting it in the numerator here, I put it in the denominator of the denominator, like this, it's mathematically the exact same expression. Okay, and look at what happens. You get a pi squared E all over L over R squared. Okay, and you've seen this before when we did tension members. This is the slenderness ratio. Okay, and so design of columns is definitely a function of the slenderness ratio. It depends on the area as well as the moment of inertia. Okay, and so this will give us our buckling stress. Okay, and so now we're going to kind of look at, um, at kind of, well, what does all this represent? Okay, and so here's where we take our mathematical formula and I start to apply some logic or some limitations to what the real world is going to allow. Okay, so the first thing we want to talk about is some of the assumptions. We just recall, just so we have them, that our column is perfectly straight. Okay, the load is axial, meaning there's no eccentricity. It's pinned at both ends and there's no residual stress from fabrication, okay? Meaning it's, you know, from rolling, from quenching, you know, anything that would cause our critical stress value to not be able to be reached. Okay, again, in reality, not true, not true, not true, not true. Okay, so we've got to, we're gonna have to do some corrections to make Euler work for us, and that's what AISC does, is tries to address all of these. There is no such thing as a perfectly straight column, okay? There's always, there's never a load that is perfectly concentric along the entire length of the member because members are never perfectly straight, so that can't be possible. Um, no matter how hard we try, so there will be a minimum limit that is prescribed, and it's on the order of about 5% that they make you account for in terms of eccentricity on these things. But for what we're doing with the theory, we'll, we'll get to that here in a little bit. All right, so here's what happens if I start plotting what would be the critical load versus KL over R on this. Okay, we will get an expression in which the critical load or the critical stress on this, okay, the Euler curve would plot something like this. As KL over R goes to zero, this guy asymptotically goes to infinity. Okay, now, in reality what happens is there's no way that I can get a critical stress of an infinite value onto a member. There will be a limit at which point I start to fail the material. Okay, meaning that there's an FY value, and that it, maybe it's FY, maybe it's you know some other stress, but there is a limit to the amount of load that I can put in into here. And so what happens is is that um, a lot of experimental testing was done, in which they kind of plotted a lot of data values. Now I don't have the actual curve, but the general gist of it was is that for column tests, the majority of the test results occurred between a line that looks something like this on the upper bound and another line on the lower bound. So this became the upper limit on the strength that you could count on. Okay, now if you kind of look at what happens, all right, at some point we went from what would be an elastic limit, which actually follows Euler very, very well. That dotted line comes down here, and, this, and the test results map that very, very well. Okay, that's our elastic region, and so we have one equation for the elastic stress. Okay, the region before that then is where I'm failing the material and it's you know, starting to separate 
or de deform the crystalline structure, um, yielding the cross section, if you will. And they found that from this limit over to the left, it was fairly constant. And now there was a the test results showed it ticked up a little bit for really, really short columns. But, um, but in general, we just assume that it's kind of a constant behavior. So that gives me two fairly well-defined regions. Okay, the elastic region that followed the Euler buckling and the inelastic region, which was limited by the material strength of the limits, meaning that the column didn't experience a failure due to length or geometry. It failed because the material itself failed. Whereas this, you notice that the load drops off very quickly as K over R um, increases. Okay, meaning that even though this is what the material is capable of holding up at this line on here, I could only get to here before I buckle the member and fail it geometrically. Okay, and so that's our problem on here. Okay, um, so it does a good job of plotting, you know, of predicting these elastic limits. Okay, hence, you know, it's called an elastic, you know, Euler buckling value. So that's, so it follows very well. It's the inelastic region that we have a problem. So when we get into AISC in the future videos, we're going to have to take into account both of those. All right, so that's kind of our basic mechanics approach and things that we're looking at and where we're going to be going with setting up Euler buckling for um, column analysis. In the next video, we'll start talking about some modifications that have to also happen to our basic formula as well to account for some of these non-realistic assumptions that we're having on here. Okay, and so what, I'll, what will happen is, is that even though he, we assumed it's pinned at both ends, there's no such thing as a true pin. There's always some sort of friction, or maybe I have a fixed end, okay, that I have to modify my equations a little bit to account for this, okay? This is going to lead us into something called effective length. Okay, our effective length, and that will be the purpose of the next video. So I will see you guys over there. If you found this useful or have any questions, please leave us some comments down below. Make sure you subscribe to the video, and we will see you momentarily in the next video. Happy engineering.